Nice crowd. Good afternoon. What a beautiful day in October in Manhattan, Kansas. We'll take it. Well, to everyone here and in Forum Hall, and welcome to the 140th Landon Lecture on Public Affairs. The Landon Lectures were started in 1966 by the late Governor Alf Landon and the late K-State President James McCain. The goal of the Landon Lectures is to bring the most prominent public figures to Kansas State University to discuss the pressing issues of the day. We are very pleased this afternoon to welcome the former president of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, to the Landon podium, please. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, you are joining 139 predecessors in bringing your thoughts and opinions on important public issues. Before introducing President Gorbachev, I'd like to introduce the other members of the platform party. On my left, Dr. Tom Harrell, Professor of Animal Science and Industry, and the President of the Kansas State University Faculty Senate. Next to him, a rising star in Kansas and American politics, Michael Burns, a senior in agricultural economics and the student body president of K-State. <laughs> On my right, longtime friend, Edward Seaton, chairman of the Landon Patrons and editor-in-chief and publisher of the Manhattan Mercury. Next to him, Dr. Charles Reagan, Associate to the President and Chairman of the Landon Lecture Series. Chuck. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a number of distinguished guests here this afternoon. First, I want to introduce to you a, a great friend of Kansas State University, General Richard Myers. General? There he is. And Mary Jo Myers, please. Now, I'm sure most of you know that General Myers is a 1965 graduate of Kansas State University and is the greatest chairman of the Joint Chiefs in American history. We are also pleased to have three members of the Kansas Board of Regents here this afternoon. They include Regent Donna Shank, who's also the chairperson of the Kansas Board of Regents. Donna, would you please stand? There she is. Donna, thank you for coming. Then Regent Nelson Galley. Nelson, would you please stand? And then a former state senator and now regent, Christine Downey Schmidt. Christine, would you please stand? <laughs> and then we have three of our local and regional legislators here. Senator Roger Wrights, would you please stand? <laughs> Representative Tom Hawk. And Representative Sidney Carlin, thank you, thank you for coming. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you can't imagine what a great pleasure it is to introduce one of the giants of the 20th century and one of the most important leaders 
in the whole world in the post-World War II era, namely President Mikhail Gorbachev. We're not ready yet, but I'm just saying once again how happy we are to have you here. Well, as I'm sure most everybody here knows, he served as the leader of the Soviet Union from 1985 to 1991. He is known around the world then and now for opening up the Soviet society and improving relations with Western Europe and the United States of America. He signed two very important disarmament agreements with the United States and ensured that the transition from communism to Western-style democracy was peaceful. He introduced to the whole world, just remember this, two new words, perestroika, which means restructuring, and glasnost, which means openness. Two very important words for the world. As a result of his many achievements for the Soviet Union and the world, Mr. Gorbachev was the recipient of the 1990 Nobel Peace Prize. In 1992, Mr. Gorbachev became president of the Gorbachev Foundation, known as the International Foundation for Social, Economic, and Political Studies. His foundation is a nonprofit, nonpartisan educational foundation. In 1993, Mr. Gorbachev founded the environmental organization Green Cross International. This is a non-governmental group with chapters in the US, Russia, and the Netherlands, Japan, and Switzerland, just to name a few. Green Cross International is a three-pronged program with a mission to clean up military toxins, assist in the creation of global ecological law, and foster a value shift on the environment. Mr. Gorbachev is a graduate of Moscow State University, and he has his law degree. During the 1950s, he served as first secretary for the Stavropol City Committee. In 1971, he was elected as a member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. From 1978 to 1985, he served as secretary for the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and in effect was the Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Gorbachev also served as deputy of the Supreme Soviet from 1970 to 1990 and acted as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee from 1984 to 1985. From 1985 to 1991, he was the president of the Soviet Union. I'm sure that everyone here is familiar with a crucial turning point in U.S.-Soviet relations in 1989, signified by the opening of the Berlin Wall. President Gorbachev and U.S. President Ronald Reagan will be given credit by historians for the monumental and peaceful changes in world geopolitics brought about by their disarmament treaties and by the actions that each of them took, especially their joint actions to end the so-called Cold War. Ladies and gentlemen, it is virtually impossible to put into words the huge and extraordinary role that Mikhail Gorbachev had, not only on ending the Cold War, but also in setting the stage for the Russian people to have freedom and liberty for the first time in 1,000 years. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to invite President Mikhail Gorbachev, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, to the Landon Podium. Ladies and gentlemen, the President, Mikhail Gorbachev. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Спасибо, я очень рад такому настроению. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to see that you are all in good spirits. Меня это стимулирует. Uh, that uh, stimulates me. Спасибо. Thank you again. И хочу поблагодарить за like этот прекрасный погожий uh, день. For this wonderful, wonderful day, good weather. В каком красивом месте вы живете и учитесь? You live and study in a really wonderful place. А в Москве вчера выпал снег. In Moscow yesterday it was snowing. Вот они различия, и их много. Климатические, исторические, этнические, политические, ментальные и так далее. И все это надо уважать. Это ключ к моему разговору. Ибо если мы не признаем этот принцип, признание культурного и этнического многообразия, ничего не удастся нам сделать с тем, чтобы в этом очень сложном мире мы смогли решать задачи особой сложности и особой ответственности. 20 лет с начала перестройки. Это произошло Тогда, когда стали остро проблемы не только в нашей стране, но и в мире. И мы, одна из сверхдержав, должны были думать о том, что делать дальше. Так мы вышли на политику перестройки. So that was the incentive for us to start Perestroika. У России три события в двадцатом веке сыграли огромное воздействие на жизнь моей страны и на весь остальной мир. Это революция 1917 года. Это победа над фашизмом в Великой И это перестройка. And finally, перестройка. С 1982 года один за другим уходит Starting из жизни три подряд генеральных секретаря. Это уже носило драматический характер. And this was perceived in rather dramatic terms. И у повестки дня, по сути дела, стал вопрос о смене поколений на самой вершине власти в СССР. Общество требует перемен, вот то, что звучало и висело в воздухе тогда. Главный лейтмотив оценок ситуации в СССР в общественных кругах был таков. Так дальше жить нельзя. Да, самая богатая страна интеллектуальными и природными ресурсами оказалась не в состоянии обеспечить достойные условия жизни граждан. Неповоротливая экономика, засилие бюрократии, монополия одной партии, одной идеологии, все это мешало Impeded growth and impeded necessary change. Our country was being stifled because of the absence of freedom. Stalinism and the system that it generated was being rejected at the popular level, at the cultural level. Add to this the fact that the economy was stagnating and was more and more lagging behind the developed world. The rate of growth was getting lower and lower. The productivity was one-third of what it was in the West, and in agriculture, just one-fifth of what it was in the developed countries. We were producing extremely costly products because the cost per unit of production was greater, twice as high as 
the cost per unit of production in the advanced countries that were using modern technologies. The quality of those products was uh, acceptable only in the defense sector and was comparable to other countries, whereas in all other sectors it was inferior. The negative socio-economic, political, and cultural processes underway in the Soviet Union weakened the Soviet Union's foreign policy position. So changes were overdue, and uh, the attempts to start such changes had been taken before by Brezhnev, by Kasigin, and by Khrushchev before them. But uh, as soon as it became clear that the system needed changing, any attempt stopped. So it was extremely difficult to start the process of change. It had to be started from above. It all depended on whether at the top of power there would be people who would venture to start radical changes in this vast country, who would venture to start systemic changes in our country. But change was also needed in the world. Change was necessary because in many parts of the world there was no democracy. Change was necessary because the world was facing problems such as poverty and many other problems that we still face and that I will discuss later. But uh, if you recall the period of the beginning of the 1980s, the main thing that strikes you is that all of us were passengers on this deadly train that was called the nuclear arms race. This train had the kind of speed and momentum such that many people believed that it could not be stopped, that it could not be even slowed down. This was extremely dangerous because the nuclear conflict could start perhaps not because of a political decision, but also because of a failure in the command and control systems of these uh, powerful weapons. The ideological and political confrontation, the uh, confrontation of the different uh, social models, all of this taken together, the domestic and the external factors dictated to us the need for change. The policy of perestroika, the philosophical base of perestroika, the new political thinking were a response not only to the problems that we were facing in the USSR, but also to the problems of the world. On March the 11th, after the death of my predecessor, Konstantin Chernenko, the plenary meeting of the Central Committee convened to decide who would become the new General Secretary of the Central Committee. It was necessary not only to elect new leaders, it was necessary to undertake a radical renewal. You can imagine uh, what kind of leadership we had at that time, given that I was at that time 54 years old and I was the youngest member of the Politburo. All the others were over 70 years old. In this huge country that needed leadership, that needed leaders who can work at full speed, so to say. This system was not working. It was rusty, to say the least. So the Central Committee had uh, several factions. Among those um, factions were people who wanted to preserve the status quo. But the group of relatively young members of the Soviet leadership um, who, were, who had been supported by Yuri Andropov and some people from the older generation of Soviet leaders understood the need for 
change for the generational change in the Soviet leadership. We also had to take into account the feelings of the people. The people, the Soviet society was very critical of the leadership that it was getting from the Soviet uh, Politburo. At that time, I had uh, spent 50 years in politics already at the regional level. Then I spent uh, seven years in the Politburo working with Brezhnev, Andropov, and Chernenko. And I have to say that uh, Chernenko was um, a very sick person and uh, he was ill all the time and therefore I had to take over to chair the meetings of the Politburo and uh, to preside over the decision-making process. This was very important for me. This was the moment that played an important role because at that time I was in charge, I was, uh, so to say, at the steering wheel of that great country, and I had a very good idea of what the uh, situation was in the country, in the various regions, and what was happening to the system. So finally, I was elected uh, unanimously the General Secretary of the Central Committee. At that time, in the beginning of Perestroika, we were getting tremendous support from the people, and that was of great importance for me. Relying on that support, I was able to take a risk to venture on the path of great far-reaching changes. To speak of the foreign policy, there too we understood that we could not continue as before. The world was seized with conflicts aflame in many parts of the world. The arms race was a problem that was not being addressed. So we understood that this was something that needed to be addressed and this was the context within which we were contemplating our decisions and our steps. So we proposed the policy of perestroika to our own people and our people supported perestroika. Together with our Western partners and in particular the United States, we were able to engage a serious dialogue, a dialogue that resulted in a new vision of the world and in a new approach to building international relations. For the USSR, perestroika meant overcoming totalitarianism and uh, moving toward democracy, toward freedom. But this did not happen overnight. As we were moving forward, as we were taking steps in domestic policy, we saw increasing resistance, particularly among bureaucracy, the party bureaucracy, the state bureaucracy, and the military bureaucracy. And among some people, too, among part of our society, perestroika was seen as some kind of gift from heavens, that something, that things will change for the better overnight. We were saying that change is something that everyone needs to do, all of us, from an ordinary worker to the General Secretary of the Communist Party, needed to change. We had initial illusions, the illusion of being able to improve the old system, that we could give second wind to the old system without really changing it. But that failed, and therefore, Toward the end of 1986, we began to contemplate political reforms. That was the first step along the path of reforming, replacing the system. We 
proposed a step-by-step -step approach to reforming Soviet society, moving gradually toward freedom and democracy and uh, market economics. This ideology, this philosophy of perestroika would result in bringing together the interests of individuals on the one hand and of the whole of society on the other hand. The most important thing, of course, was to place the individual, the human being, at the center of this change. So let me now very quickly describe some aspects of that period because I would like to give more time to the current situation. In August 1991, the attempt was made to organize a coup d'etat. The putsch, the coup d'etat, weakened my position and as a result, the leaders of Russia, Ukraine and Belarus agreed to dismantle the Soviet Union. They did that behind my back. So, Perestroika is the period that started on March 11, 1985 and ended on December 25, 1991. What happened afterwards was a different history, was a different course. Boris Yeltsin had a different strategy. That strategy included breaking up the country for Russia to abandon the other republics and, um, as he hoped, to move forward more rapidly without that burden of the other republics. That was an illusion. Illusion in public policy means misadventure, a reckless adventure that ended badly. The country disintegrated. The wealth of our nation was plundered and uh, the economy was opened up while it was not ready to compete with the more advanced economies. That virtually destroyed the economy, the savings of the people and the economic situation as a result of those policies brought the country to the brink of catastrophe. It is only because of the enormous resources and also because of the efforts at the local and regional level that that blow was uh, to some extent um, uh, softened, but it was a heavy blow and we are still living the consequences of uh, those policies. And therefore, I am often asked whether perestroika was defeated or it was victorious. Well, it is true that perestroika was interrupted. It is true that we were not able to achieve all the goals that we had planned. However, we were able to do something fundamental that is ending the totalitarian system, implementing a pluralistic economy and uh, creating opportunities for people to benefit from freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of uh, assembly. The country opened up to the world and the world opened to us. We also adopted a law on the freedom of movement, on freedom of emigration. And finally, we prepared a draft uh, union treaty for a new union of the republics. And uh, what we were able to do up until August 1991 is the is uh, what enabled us, what enabled the country to continue to move forward. Our country will not return to the past. This is not just a political statement. This is the view, this is the position, the opinion of our entire society, and that is the greatest historical achievement of perestroika.
всегда вспоминаю своего профессора, когда пью водку, воду перед вами. I, I always need to take a glass of water. <laughs> I recall my old professor. Not vodka, certainly water. <laughs> you, you know that I instituted an anti-drinking campaign when I was the Soviet leader. Uh, that campaign, unfortunately, didn't work. But uh, nevertheless, it is now remembered. It is now remembered. People remember that at that time the Soviet Union had the uh, highest uh, life expectancy among men and women in our history. We had a higher birth rate at that time. Millions of lives were saved uh, because um, um, those additional deaths because of uh, drinking did not happen. Productivity grew, discipline uh, uh, improved uh, in uh, the transportation sector, etc., etc. I recall that professor, my university professor, because he, like me, had um, a throat problem, and he always had uh, some water on his lectern in order to drink uh, some water, and uh, one day, he was not given that uh, water one day, one day, as they say. Those episodes are sometimes very important in our lives. So then they brought that glass of water, and uh, we were fourth-year students at that time, and uh, we uh, laughed and joked when water was brought in. The professor looked at us, and he said, colleagues. He recognized us as... Uh, people who would become his colleagues uh, soon. So he said, colleagues, even the best speech and even the best lecture needs to be watered down. So let's look at Russia today. During the first uh, presidency of President Putin, he was able to stabilize the situation in the country, and uh, now there is a chance that we can continue changes, we can continue reforms. Had Putin been able to do that alone, had he been um, able just to overcome the chaos that he inherited from Boris Yeltsin, uh, that alone, he would uh, make him go down in Russian history. Even though uh, Putin is being criticized in uh, Russia and uh, in Europe and in the United States, he continues to have support from the people. He has very high popularity rating because he has proposed some very important priorities, some very important uh, programs which, if implemented, uh, can significantly improve people's lives. People still uh, live, many people still live in poverty, and that is happening at a time when there are um, perhaps as many billionaires in Russia as uh, in America. Uh, Putin is trying to change things for the better, to redirect the economy for the benefit of the people, and that's why people support him. At this time, we are facing really important choices. If uh, the goals set by President Putin becomes the agenda, the agenda for the whole country, then Russia will have a healthier future. If, however, these changes are prevented if they are impeded, and there is a lot of resistance to the president's agenda, then we might uh, see a disastrous turn of events. And therefore, when the president is being criticized, I always defend him. I do sometimes criticize him. Of course, uh, that's uh, normal to criticize. When the opposition criticizes uh, Putin, um, I understand that. When, however, Putin is criticized from abroad, then I ask, why is it that uh, our 
uh, foreign part partners uh, общем, do not like Putin's policies. So again, we are facing a moment of choice for Russia, and uh, the near future will show how things will proceed, in which direction they will go. Let's go back to uh, not only uh, the domestic uh, policy, but the important changes that Perestroika produced in international affairs. We were able to establish dialogue and normal relations with the United States of America, and I would like to pay tribute to President Ronald Reagan and Secretary of State Schultz. They did a great deal. They uh, also had to overcome some resistance, including resistance among their own people to meet us halfway. I believe that President Reagan was a great president and I pay tribute for his contribution. This is what I say wherever I go. Even though, of course, one can criticize President Reagan, one can criticize anyone, but as they say, so to say, from above, it was decided that our paths should cross. And together we were able to redirect the affairs of the world away from the Cold War. For 30 years, we had had uh, a hostile relationship with uh, China. We normalized those relations. We had excellent uh, relations with India, with all European countries. We established close cooperation. Germany was unified after the Velvet Revolution in Central and Eastern Europe. Those nations, too, were given a right to choose. We never interfered on the very first day of my um, leadership, I said to my colleagues from the Warsaw Treaty, you should develop your own policies. We will not interfere in your affairs because it's your responsibility. Many of them later regretted that we took that position. They tried to make us intervene. But we continued to work with them. We continued to provide overall security, but the rest of it was in their hands, and that was of great importance. Our forces, our troops, our politicians never intervened, never interfered in what those countries decided. I am sometimes, it is sometimes said that I gave away Poland, I gave away Hungary, I gave away the Czech Republic. Well, I gave it to their people. I gave Hungary to the Hungarians, Poland to the Polish. That's how it should be. The achievements of Perestroika were possible, above all, because of the proper evaluation of the situation in the world, of the situation in our country, our fundamental assessments and our fundamental decisions proved to be correct. We stated that our country needed change, and in the second phase of our change, we concluded that we needed to replace the old system, and we dismantled and replaced that system. We also stated that in addition to the national interest, class and corporate interests, there are also universal interests of all mankind. This is because we live in a different world, in a world where we have nuclear weapons capable of destroying our planet, in a world where we are facing the global challenges that we cannot address alone, in a world where no country can achieve security alone. This, I think, is what America should bear in mind, too. If things are bad in the world, things are bad for everyone. We will not be able alone to solve 
environmental problems. No country alone can solve the problem of the environment, the most important <coughs> problem today. So it was very important that we evaluated correctly those challenges that were facing the world at that time. We believed and we believe that the universal interest of all mankind should be the highest priority. We also noted, we stated that we live in an interdependent and interrelated world where no country can solve its problems alone. So, based on that, we took strategy decisions, the decision in favor of democracy, freedom, and the rule of law, the decision in favor of ending the arms race and the global confrontation. The lessons of those times should be learned now. We see that the world is changing very rapidly. We see that um, some changes have made the world really different beyond recognition compared to 20 years ago. If I asked you, for example, to raise hands, those uh, who have uh, cell phones, you would all raise uh, your hands, but just 10 years ago, we didn't have that. So things have changed over the past, not just 20, but 10, 15 years. Today, as 20 years ago, the most important thing is to correctly evaluate and assess the main trends in the world today. We are facing a very complex, a very contradictory and rapidly changing world with a tremendous flow of information and uh, that results in great uncertainty and wherever I go, I see that people are worried. They're worried about the future. Today, the interdependence and the interconnectedness of the world what we call globalization, has increased more than ever before. Globalization is pushing the world to the future, toward the future, but nevertheless, we see that uh, globalization does not include billions of people. Finally, we see in the world today the emergence of new giants, China, India, Brazil, the world feels that those countries are making an increasing impact on all economic and political processes. They are becoming important decision makers and we should rethink the world in view of these new trends in the world today. And of course solutions are not military solutions. Solutions are intellectual, solutions are political, <coughs> solutions are that we should build a new relationship that would organically include, integrate those new giants into the global processes. The United States has a special role and position in the world today. It is the only superpower in the world today. We also see that Europe is uniting and is becoming an increasingly positive factor in the world today. I believe that the emergence of the united Europe is a very positive factor. It is a factor for peace and democracy in the world. We also see the democratic transition of Russia and of the former Soviet republics. We generally see a democratic process in the world today. But at the same time, we see the adaptation of the Islamic world to the challenges of the world. And this is a very problematic process. The Islamic world has been a factor in world developments for many centuries, but today the Islamic world has been 
marginalized in the global process. And that means that one billion people have been marginalized, and I believe that uh, that could result in a lot of trouble if that situation continues. So this is the world that we are facing, the world in which we live today. In this world, mankind is looking for responses to the new challenges of the 21st century, the challenge of security, the challenge of poverty and environment, the challenge of the global environmental crisis. In the mid-1980s, we regarded the ending of the arms race as our greatest priority, as our highest priority. And at that time, we united our efforts and we were able to succeed in ending the arms race. The new thinking at that time was not some kind of epiphany. It didn't come out of nowhere. It was consistent with the main principle of international law and international cooperation. I believe that today, as then, we need a new thinking, a new thinking for the new century. The political problem today is that politics is lagging behind. Politics is lagging behind because, first of all, it's important to understand the world, to develop a vision, a strategy, and then to move forward within that framework. Of course, I do not have any ready-made philosophy for this new century, for these new problems. It would be presumptuous of me, and uh, I don't want to be presumptuous at my age. I will be 75 years old next year. So I want my recommendations to be serious, so let me share with you some thoughts in this regard. First of all, whereas globalization is inevitable and an objective process, we should know, we should understand that billions of people have not yet benefited from globalization. Globalization has benefited mostly the rich, wealthy nations. The gap between the wealthy nations and poor countries have grown. Three billion people live on two, less than two dollars a day. One billion people in the world live on less than one dollar a day. This could mean a lot of trouble for the world. And therefore, we have to overcome the uncontrolled nature of globalization, and we have to give globalization a human dimension, a human face. Let us listen to those who are calling for globalization with a human face. If globalization is only meant to increase profits without paying attention to social problems, ethnic problems, environmental problems, such globalization is dangerous. And let's bear this in mind when we think about uh, this global world. Let me also speak about the role of the United States. America has a right to claim leadership because of its power, because of its democratic traditions, because of its cultural and economic influence. But this leadership should be exercised not through domination, but through partnership with other nations. The past few years have shown that people in the world do not accept 
attempts to dictate to them or attempts by any country to be a world policeman. And I think that it's very important that uh, after the recent very difficult uh, years, we have seen that uh, in the administration, in the American political community, there is a growing understanding of this, and I believe this is very important, and I think that this will move this great country toward a better understanding of its role and responsibility in the world. As for the European role, I believe that we should recognize its positive potential. We should not divide Europe into the old Europe and the new Europe. We should respect the choices made by the European nations. At the same time, Europe itself should, it must, take very important decisions, very responsible decisions as regards the model of development in Europe and as regards the pace of unification, because we don't want this very important project to fail. The democratic transition in Russia and other countries is has been more difficult, more painful than many people had thought. But let us trust the new democracies. Let us understand that they should find their own model of democracy, their own democratic structure. Let us not try to impose democracy by means of interference or military intervention, or by means of imposing, imposing economic models from advanced countries to other nations. Finally, the Islamic world requires understanding and respect. We see that it can move toward adjusting, toward adapting to the global world. And we in other nations should understand the aspirations of those countries where Islam is their religion. If we achieve that, if we achieve that, that could be very important in stabilizing the overall situation in the world. Let us not think of the Islamic world as just a supplier of terrorism. After all, there are other terrorists as well, and also I believe that they do not represent that faith. Those are disoriented people who were recruited by the terrorist centers, recruited by those who exploit, who speculate uh, on religion. Any religion has fundamentalists, so let us not accuse just Islam of this. It's very important to understand that in that country, so a respectful dialogue with the Islamic world is the only correct path. So we are facing a different world. In this context, there is a great need for rethinking the role of the West in the global process. I believe that we should act now, we should act quickly in order to unite our efforts in the face of the global challenges that I described. The main problem is the problem of governance, and I'm not speaking of a world government. I believe that we need a system at the national level, the regional level, at the level of international organizations, and a new role of the United Nations. It is easy to condemn the United Nations, but it is more difficult and it's very important to reform the United Nations in order to make that organization consistent with the needs of our time. We need the political will in order to successfully do that. We need, I believe, a kind of a global compact on the principles of new 
world institutions. I believe that those institutions should provide for peace in a world of ethnic and cultural diversity. We need a mechanism that would help us to address the problem of overcoming poverty and backwardness by accumulating the allocation of 0.7 uh, percent of the GDP for development assistance to overcome, to overcome poverty and backwardness. Up until now, that goal set by the United Nations and accepted by all the nations has been achieved by only three countries. So we need to work step by step. We need to make a transition to a new world order. The late Pope, John Paul II, said that we need a world order, a world order that would be more stable, more just, more equitable, and more humane. Indeed, no one knows the details of the new international order, but I believe that the goals set by His Holiness, the Pope, are very important are very important to all of us, and let's bear those goals in mind. To conclude, to conclude my remarks on the future of the world, let me say that we need an answer to the question of what kind of world we should strive for. Certainly that should not be based on the position of one country. It should be a world which is good for all nations. This is something that I believe will be, will be achieved. So let me quote from a very interesting speech a speech that was made on June 10, 1963, by the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy. This is what he said, speaking at American University in Washington. I quote, The most important subject is peace. What kind of peace am I speaking about? What kind of peace should we strive for? It's not a Pax Americana imposed by American weapons of war. It's not the peace of the grave and not the safety of a slave. I'm speaking of a true peace, a peace for which one wants to live, a peace that enables every nation, every person to grow, to hope, and to build a better life for their children. It is a peace not just for Americans, but a peace for all people. It is a peace not only for today, but also for tomorrow. A true peace should be the result of the efforts of many nations a sum of many actions. It should be dynamic, not static. It should be changing in order to respond to the challenges of every new generation. Because peace is a process. Peace is a way of addressing problems. Today we are facing a situation that is as important for mankind as the situation when these prophetic words of President Kennedy were spoken. I believe that perhaps he died for those words. So we need a new vision, a new policy. We need a political will and responsibility that he mentioned at that time, and I very much share this view of John F. Kennedy. We need that approach today even more than yesterday. Thank you.
Well, President Gorbachev, what a spirited, excellent, and heartfelt presentation. Would you not agree with me that we just heard from one of the five greatest leaders of the post-World War II period? Before we have questions, and by the way, the questions, if you have questions over here, move to your right. See the mic over there? And then over here, if you have a question, move to your left. And before we hear a question, I want to introduce one other person. Mr. Gorbachev has his daughter here today, and I would like to introduce her, Irane Gorbachev, please. There she is right there. Thank you very much. Also introduce Ms. Dr. Lichtenthal, president of Green Cross International. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, questions. Please, what, you have a question over here. Is it on? <laughs> Privyet. Hello, Mr. President. You mentioned that the first phase of perestroika was, you initially thought, would give wind to the old, second wind to the old system. If that had been successful, if, if the, the economy had done well, would you have been satisfied with no reforms in the political system and in the new freedoms? I ask that because some people say that you became a Democrat when all, everything else failed, and then if the reforms had continued, you would have been happy if the Communist Party maintained its uh, power in the hierarchy. Thank you. Well, I would not agree with this uh, view as to when I became a Democrat. <laughs> Вы знаете, перед советским руководством, когда оно сформировалось уже в новом составе, в 85 году, вот был выбор, хотим ты или нет, можно идти дальше было по инерции. Uh, in 1985, the Soviet leadership, the new Soviet leadership faced a choice. We could uh, continue as before in an inertial manner. И я думаю, если мы выбор сделали в пользу перестройки, гласности, демократии, а это сразу зазвучало во всех наших планах, докладах и, и начали осуществляться, приниматься решения этот счет. Это говорит о том, что мы выбрали путь демократии. But we from the very start uh, uh, decided in favor of democracy, in favor of glasnost, in favor of perestroika, and we took specific decisions in that direction. Поэтому прошу не подвергать сомнению мою демократическую позицию. So I would ask you not to doubt my democratic credentials. <laughs> okay, now. Hello, Mr. President. I'm here today uh, on behalf of actually millions of Americans who are concerned with your anti-constitutional behavior in regards to the environment, the environmental movement. Uh, the Earth Charter, your organizations, the Gorbachev Foundation, Green Cross, and Green Shield, and uh, the UN's Agenda 21. Uh, it seems that the sustainability campaign of uh, UN, the UN Agenda 21 is really just code for land grabbing. I wish you could uh, comment on that, please.
Карте Земли – это тот документ, который родился в рамках зеленого движения, потому что это не только идея зеленого креста, это одновременно идея Совета Земли. Uh, the Earth Charter was not produced by just by Green Cross International. This is a document that was developed as a result of common efforts by many environmental organizations, by many green organizations, including the Earth Council and many others. Это идея, которую поддержали многие правительства. This uh, Earth Charter has now been uh, supported by many governments. Вопрос был поставлен так, что мы уже дошли до грани, и дальше начнутся такие разрушения в биосфере, которые приведут, вообще говоря, к удару по роду человеческому. The Earth Charter recognizes that we have come to a point when the biosphere is being destroyed irreversibly, and this could have disastrous consequences for mankind. Тогда очень отчетливо в выступлениях многих звучала тема «Нам нужны своего рода новые заповеди». And when we were drafting the Earth char Charter, uh, many of uh, the drafters called for a kind of new set of commandments, environmental uh, commandments. Была создана комиссия, в которой представлены были все континенты планеты. The drafting commission had representatives from all continents. Это интеллектуалы, это политики, это представители малых народов. Uh, it included not only intellectuals and the political figures, but also people representing indigenous nations and others. Возглавлял ее замечательный американец, замечательный американец, интеллектуал, способный выслушивать всякую ересь, которую несли в комиссию эту, и поражал своим демократизмом. Профессор... Профессор Рокфеллер, только младший. It was headed by an American, um, a person whom I consider a wonderful person, an intellectual, a very tolerant person, a person who was able to listen, uh, to listen to good thoughts and stupid thoughts, but a person who was able to integrate uh, different uh, viewpoints, Professor Stephen Rockefeller. Пять лет мы работали. We worked for five years. Я входил в комиссию I was a member of that commission. вместе с бывшим премьер-министром э, Голландии Лю, э, Рудом Люберсом я представлял Европу. Мне кажется, несмотря на все трудности, которые, с которыми мы встретились, получился замечательный документ, в котором, в котором в концентрированной форме, по сути дела, в 18 пунктах сформулированы самые главные озабоченности и одновременно и высказаны, я бы сказал, приоритеты, руководство с которым надо решать проблемы сохранения земли. And I believe that even though this was a difficult process, as a result, we were able to develop a document that I think is a remarkable document. Uh, those 18 commandments, they reflect our concerns for the environment, but also the priorities, how we should move in order to save the Earth. In many countries, it has become a book. In Germany, for example, the second book was published, and there were 200,000 copies of the Earth's Earth. And uh, this is a uh, paper, a document that is working in Germany, for example, 200,000 copies of the Earth Charter have been printed. А сейчас во многих странах уже идут и продолжают разворачиваться в других странах в связи с Харти Земли, как мы их назвали, дискуссии? Диалоги. Диалоги о Земле. And диалоги о земле, диалоги о воде, диалоги, то есть самые животропещущие проблемы экологии. And we are continuing this process, we are continuing this process as a dialogue. In a number of countries we are conducting earth dialogues on the basis of the earth charter to discuss the most acute problems such as water, land, air and the others. Я не буду перечислять, я просто хочу сказать, этот документ уже живет, работает. И я думаю, он сыграет свою роль сейчас, когда 
люди вообще во все, на всем земном шаре очень обеспокоены судьбой природы. So I believe that this is a living document, this is a working document, and I believe that it will play a positive role in addressing our environmental concerns. Никогда ни одна инициатива крупного масштаба не обходилась без того, чтобы на нее находились критики, сомневающиеся. Не будем обращать на это. Any major initiative can be criticized, but I believe that this is a positive initiative. Yes, Pizza. Mikhail Sergeyevich, здравствуйте. Can I speak? Привет. I can speak Russian. Uh, can, I, can I actually ask you in Russian language, can you translate? Um, Михаил Сергеевич, я хочу, конечно, сказать вам большое спасибо и признательно за то, что вы вернули в нашу страну свободу, то, что наши люди um, приобрели возможность исповедовать религию свободно, и возможность говорить споко свободно, не боясь. И у меня к вам, конечно, вопрос, три вопроса. <laughs> the young lady says that she uh, is grateful to President Gorbachev for bringing freedom of religion and freedom of speech to uh, the people of the Soviet Union. And in this connection, she would like to ask President Gorbachev just three questions. I, I have a hundred questions for you. Um, Михаил Сергеевич, я с Украины, и, насколько я поняла с вашей лекции, вы не очень согласны с тем, что Советский Союз развалился, и что мы, э, я думаю, что вы считаете, что все же Советский Союз лучше, чем э, те страны, которые сейчас Давайте отсоединились. Давайте я отвечу, я понял Хорошо. ваш вопрос. Um, uh, I So apparently you think that it would have been better for the Soviet Union to continue rather than to have those um, independent republics. Наш союз нужно было реформировать и прежде всего децентрализовать. I understand your он если это не сделать, то могла наступить дезинтеграция. I understand your question. I believe that our union uh, should have been reformed. It should have been decentralized because without decentralization, the country could not continue. Поэтому я возглавлял комиссию по подготовке нового союза договора, и он был готов и назначен на дата подписания 20 августа. And therefore, I chaired the commission that developed the new draft union treaty, and that treaty was ready for signing on August the 20th, 1991. И вот мы должны его были подписывать. Путь чистый поняли, что они проигрывают. And a majority of the republics were ready to sign that treaty with the exception of the Baltic states and there was some hesitation in some other republics, but basically that treaty was ready for signing and those who organized the coup against me understood that uh, uh, as a result, uh, you know, they, they would have lost. Я был за союз как и были 75 с лишним процентов населения Союза за сохранение Союза, но его реформирование. I favored the continuation and the reformation of the Union, and 75% of the people of the Soviet Union voted in the referendum in favor of this position. Я говорил, что раз развал Союза может обернуться бедой колоссальных масштабов. Все точно так и получилось. Но сейчас, когда союза нет, он распался, и когда возникли 15 независимых государств, и в рамках суверенитета каждого народа они ведут реформы, обустраивают свои, на основе своего видения жизнь. Тяжело всем, очень. 
Я высказываю то, что сейчас всякие идеи насчет того, что снова возродить СССР, это уже будет непродуктивно, более того, будет дезориентировать народы. Uh, Even though things are difficult in most of those republics, I believe that their sovereignty, their political independence should be recognized, and therefore I am against any attempt to call for the restoration of the Soviet Union. That would be very harmful, that would be counterproductive. Но я за то, чтобы интеграционные процессы на постсоветском пространстве осуществлялись, ибо развал Союза – это был развал кооперационных связи всех, нарушены все связи. Это ударило по всем странам. И сейчас идет процесс налаживания этих э, интеграционных связей. Я за, но я не за создание союзного государства. Um, I believe, however, that the economic uh, integration of those republics would be very constructive, very helpful, because the economic breakup resulted in great difficulties for the economies of all of those uh, 15 republics. However, again, I do not believe that there should be any kind of political integration, that there should be a new uh, political union of those republics. Ну, еще вам один вопрос, не больше. Um, you're allowed one more question. Хорошо. Мой вопрос будет такого характера. Представьте себе, вы президент России в данный момент, в 2005 году. Как бы вы повели нашу страну сейчас, в данный момент? Как бы было бы это как-то иначе? Согласны ли вы с политикой Владимира Путина? If you were the president of Russia now in 2005, Uh, how and where would you lead the country? Do you agree with the policies currently pursued by President Putin? I believe that I replied to this question in my talk. I said that I support President Putin's political course. Но я очень критически отношусь и к правительству и парламенту, которые могут не потянуть эту ношу. However, I am а сейчас не хотелось бы потерять время, ибо оно очень важно для России. However, I'm very critical of the cabinet of ministers and of the parliament. I believe that uh, uh, they are, it, it will be very difficult for them. They are perhaps not up to the tasks that uh, President Putin has set. And uh, uh, this is important because right now we really have no time to lose. We should not lose any more time. Uh, hello, Mikhail Sergeyevich. My name is Tatiana Lin. I'm from Political Science Department. I am from Russia. So it's such a great honor to meet with you today. I have a question. Uh, uh, the Russians are very active here. <laughs> As you mentioned, you support um, all the policies uh, by Господа, President Vladimir Putin, but I have a question. Do you think that the current the state of democracy in Russia might be in danger? What, how would you comment that we don't have a real uh, political opposition to the administration, that, that the first time basically in history the communist parties have to unite with other liberal parties like Yabloka in order to uh, have to balance the administration? Это говорит о том, что процесс становления политических структур и, прежде всего, партий, он еще только в начале своего становления. Uh, well, the fact that the uh, communists are uniting a coalition with the more right-wing parties, the Yabloka and other democratic parties, it shows that the process of party building, of creating political parties in our country, is only in its infancy. Тем не менее, и президент Путин, но особенно правительство парламента, подвергается довольно основательной критике в прессе. И там среди э, этих критиков представлены самые разные оппозиционные слои. But we do have a lot of criticism, open criticism in our country, criticism of President Putin, criticism of the parliament, criticism of uh, 
uh, his administration. Uh, so um, I believe that that is a very important factor. Весной был я у вас и отвечал на подобный вопрос и сказал, что вам хотелось, чтобы быстрее мы все делали. Last spring, I often uh, asked the same question here in this country when I was in a visit to this country, uh, when people asked me about democracy and they said that Russia should move faster toward democracy. Я сказал, что вы несправедливы в своих претензиях. Вы and I said that I thought. And I said that uh, that kind of criticism is unfair because it took you Americans 200 years to build your democracy and you want us to succeed in 200 days. That's it. That's it. Sure, sure. That's it. That's it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's about 5 o'clock. But before leaving, we have a little gift for the president. How about this? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have a wildcat forever. Thank you so much for coming. God bless you.